Welcome back to our Bible study as we're making our way through the book of John. This week we continue in the upper room discourse as we are in John chapter 15. I have a short announcement this week and that is we are having our spring break coming up. We will, we will take off Monday, March 11th for our spring break and we will be back on Monday, March 18th. Let's go ahead and go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we have a friend in Jesus. At times, this world has a way of isolating us and beating us up emotionally, but we are thankful for the strength and the encouragement we can draw from the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. In Christ's powerful name, amen. So we get going today. I'm going to talk about something that all of us have experienced and continue to experience in this life. And that is human relationships. All of us experience multiple good or challenging relationships that tend to go up and down as we make our way through this life. Adam, while naming the animals, quickly learned that it, it wasn't good for man to be alone. And so God created Eve and ordained the first human relationship. As a consequence of the fall of humanity, human relationships with each other and with the world would become difficult. And I'm not telling you anything new or what you haven't already experienced in your own families, at church, or at work. My statements are self-evident and are universal and are a part of the human experience. So why am I bringing up relationships now as we're in the upper room with Jesus and the disciples? In our study of John, we have seen the disciples ask the wrong questions or not ask the right questions. And so Jesus, knowing their thoughts at times, would answer their unspoken questions for them. And at this point, two weeks ago, Jesus told the disciples that he was leaving. And last week, Jesus said it was a good thing that he was leaving, but the Father would send the Holy Spirit to them. And so this week, Jesus helps the disciples to understand what their future relationships would be like. <clears throat> so today, our lesson is divided into three divisions. Our first division is John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, relationship between believers and Jesus. And our second division is John chapter 15, verses 12 through 17, relationship between believers. And our last division is John chapter 15, verses 18 through 25, relationship between believers and the world. As we get started in our first division, relationship between believers and Jesus, please turn to John chapter 15, verse 1. And as I said earlier, we are still in the upper room listening to Jesus, Jesus's message to his remaining 11 disciples. Judas has left the room and the Lord continues to prepare the disciples for the shock of his death and departure. Now, <clears throat> we aren't the apostles, but we are disciples in Jesus and are members of his redeemed church. And because of that great privilege, a lot of what Jesus reveals in the upper room applies to all of us as believers in Jesus. Now let's turn to scripture as we get into today's lesson. As I read verse one, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. In this section of scripture, <clears throat> Jesus draws heavily on the metaphor of a vineyard, which is a powerful symbol running deep in Israel's history. In fact, <clears throat> the grape cluster is still a national symbol in Israel today. In the first verse, John reveals Jesus' seventh and last I am statement in the Gospel of John with, I am the true vine. What did Jesus mean when he said true vine? In the Old Testament, Israel was the vineyard cultivated by God. But instead of producing good grapes, they produced bad grapes. Essentially, Israel failed 
as a nation to be God's representative to the rest of the world. This doesn't mean God is finished with Israel, but Jesus is the new Israel, the greater Israel. There is a truism that I've mentioned before, and that is all scripture is equally true, but not all scripture is equally clear. But that is not the case like a like a parable, metaphors generally reveal a single spiritual truth and not multiple truths. It allows us to see the big picture and not milk symbolic meaning from every word. This principle will be in play next year when we're in Revelation, as we will encounter lots of metaphors with shocking symbolism. Another thing to keep in mind, when approaching challenging scripture is to apply the hermeneutic principle of considering the original audience. In this case, the original audience are the disciples with an eye to the future disciples of Jesus. Therefore, <clears throat> this isn't necessarily a passage for unbelievers. Think of it this way. It's a family talk, not a salvation message. This discussion is for how Christians are to live <clears throat> after they've been saved, which is why Jesus says in verse 3, you are already clean, meaning the disciples had already been justified. They still didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but they had been redeemed through faith in Jesus. With that in mind, what did Jesus mean when he mentioned about the Father cutting off unfruitful branches and prunes us to be more fruitful? Simply, Christians are to live fruitful lives, which is a work of God while we remain in Christ, the true vine. Now, in verses 4 through 10, Jesus mentions the word remain 11 times. Hopefully, some of you guys have had an opportunity to go through the BSF homiletic seminar. If you have, then you will remember we are to pay attention to repeated words. This is a prime example of that. Check out the screen. The word remain is peppered throughout these seven verses. <clears throat> so what is it? So what does the word remain mean in this section of scripture? Well, it simply means to stay or abide, which in its context is to remain in Jesus, which we can only do through the power of the Holy Spirit. Since we still have a fallen nature, we are prone to wander. We need the daily guidance and conviction of the Holy Spirit in our lives. This principle of remaining in Jesus is made clear in verse 5. Let's read it. I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. In verse 5, Jesus gives believers their focus. It's not on producing fruit. Our focus needs to be remaining in Jesus. We aren't to worry about the fruit. That will occur as a byproduct of remaining in Jesus. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure you all know people who are non-believers who seem to have fruit in their lives. Unbelievers have the ability to be kind, to put others before themselves, to love others, and to give to the needy and poor, and so on. These things are good, but we observe these actions from an earthly perspective. From God's perspective, if these things are done apart from Jesus, that fruit has no eternal value, regardless of how nice the person was while doing the good deed. I know this can be a bit shocking because we aren't brought up because we are brought up in a work-based, performance-based, good deeds mentality. Now, I'm not saying kindness isn't good. Kindness is a fruit of the spirit. But what I'm saying is for your kindness to have any eternal impact, it needs to be done while connected to Jesus. Okay, so if Christians who remain in Jesus produce a crop of fruit, what happens 
to Christians who have little or no visible fruit. Well, let's see what John says in verse 6. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. <clears throat> this verse is hotly debated by scholars, and the notes partially cover the debate, so I won't cover it to save time, other than to say, <clears throat> some see this verse as meaning a Christian can lose their salvation if they don't live fruitful lives. <clears throat> Others say, no fruit production in one's life shows that you never were a true Christian. Well, others would say that unfaithful Christians, not unfaith, unfruitful Christians can reach a point where they are not useful for the kingdom, and so they are taken home. Let's read what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 11 through 15. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. In these verses, Paul is using a construction metaphor instead of the grapevine, but the principle is the same. Jesus is the foundation, and what you do in this life as a believer will be judged, and some things will have eternal rewards, while others will be burned up and have no eternal value. Moving on to verse 8. Let's read it. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Now, scholars will say the purpose of humanity is to glorify God. And <clears throat> if this is true, when we run across how to glorify God in the Bible, we should pay attention to it. Here it says, when we bear fruit while being a disciple of Jesus, we bring glory to God the Father. And being a disciple of Jesus means we remain in him, and the way we remain in Jesus is by keeping his commands. The pathway to glorify God is through obedience. There's no other way of getting around it. Christians by nature are an obedient group of people. We are self-regulating. We don't need to be forced into obedience or coerced into it. The Bible says when we are, re when we are redeemed, we are, a, we are a new creation. We have a new nature. And part of that is we now have a bent towards obedience. Now, <clears throat> let's move on to verse 9 and 10. As Jesus wraps up, the importance of remaining in him. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept the Father's commands and remain in his love. With all this talk of remaining, it reminds me of the word perseverance. How important is perseverance in your walk with the Lord? Have you seen others start off strong in their walk, but not finish strong or not persevere in their faith? But there is something else going on. In these verses that Jesus is saying, did you notice that he establishes a parallel relationship? His connection to the Father is a pattern for our connection with him. He obeys and loves the Father, and we are to obey and love Christ. As we wrap up this division, let's read one more verse. Verse 11. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now, in the Gospel of John, joy has only been mentioned once before, and it was back in chapter 3. But in the upper room discourse, 
Jesus mentions it seven times. From this verse, it seems that the nature of joy, true joy, comes from abiding in Christ, which leads us to our first principle, which is fruitful believers abide in Christ. Fruitful believers abide in Christ. In this division, Jesus has revealed himself as the true vine, which is a source of life and productivity for all branches. As Christians, we all have a desire to live fruitful lives, but at times our focus is on producing fruit and we become burned out or worn out. We need to keep in mind, bearing fruit is a work of God through us. It's not a human work. Our job is to remain and abide in Christ. If we are abiding in Christ, then the fruit will follow. And from last week's lesson, we learned that the pathway to abiding in Christ starts and finishes with obeying Jesus's commands. Remember, the Christian life isn't about working harder. It's about trusting God deeper. So let me ask you, how are you relying on Jesus, the true vine, to draw strength and encouragement as you follow him? How are you relying on Jesus, the true vine, to draw strength and encouragement as you follow him? As we start our second division, relationship between believers, please turn to verse 12. In 1510, Jesus said, we are to keep his commands. Well, verse 12 will take all those commands and boil it down into one command as it relates to our relationship with other believers. With that, let's read verse 12. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. From a human perspective, this command sounds impossible. How can we love someone we barely know and who we have no emotional ties to? Well, if you think in terms of the world, worldly love is self-oriented and is performance-based, where people fall in and out of love. But in this passage, the Greek word for love is agape love, which agape love involves faithfulness, commitment, and the act of the will. It is distinguished from the other types of love by its lofty moral nature and strong character. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 describes this type of love. And honestly, to love like this takes strength and power we receive from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now let's move on to the next verse as Jesus gives the disciples a new perspective on love. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. The context of this verse is the love revealed by Jesus on the cross, where he gave his life sacrificially in a way that we are unable to do. But we can still love sacrificially by putting others' interests before our interests and desires. As revealed in the book of Acts, the disciples' sacrificial love for each other was a key in establishing the church. Moving on to verse 15, Jesus says something amazing. He elevates the disciples and all who follow him as friends. Now, how are we to understand this statement? A friend is usually someone who is a peer or an equal. Is Jesus saying we are his peer or his equal? Well, no. But what he is saying is he treats us like friends. We have access to the plan of God that non-friends wouldn't have. Though God's grace, through God's grace, Jesus elevates us to a position we don't deserve. But this elevation doesn't compromise Jesus's authority or his divinity. Moving on to verse 16, let's take a moment and read it. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. 
This verse makes it clear that believers are chosen and appointed for the purpose of obedience, which is bearing eternal fruit. Loving God and loving others allows us to produce a crop of eternal fruit. As we obey, we are transformed. As we are transformed, our will aligns with Jesus's. And we pray for what God wants to accomplish. As we wrap up this division, the BSF doctrine this week is the church. But what is the church? Is it a building where people gather to worship and praise God? Well, it's more than that. The church represents the family of God, the company of people across the ages and nations that he has redeemed and adopted as his own. The New Testament refers to the church as the body of Christ, over which Jesus Christ is the head. The life vitality of the church flow from Christ through believers and into the world. Jesus is the cornerstone of his church, which includes the foundation of the apostles and the prophets in every true believer. Faith in Christ unifies the people of the church, both with Jesus and with one another. Theologians distinguish between the visible church and the invisible church. The invisible church consists of all the redeemed throughout the church age who belong to God. The visible church includes the company we see on earth, the local church. Unfortunately, not all people who attend the visible church are born again, and therefore they do not belong to the true invisible church. But the church, true believers, draw others to Jesus by witnessing to his love for the world. Which brings us to our second principle, which is fruitful believers love one another. Fruitful believers love one another. The Bible tells us that the nature of God is love. Jesus is the Father's love revealed to mankind. And the Holy Spirit is the possession of divine love residing inside of us. Given those three amazing facts, Christians that are truly abiding in Christ should have an outflow of the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But as a word of caution, when we talk about Christian love, we need to keep in mind that we define love differently than the world. Because we love God's word and his plan, it's not loving to compromise God's word and his commandments with the world's standards. Because we love Jesus, who is the truth, and we love the spirit of truth living inside of us, we want to be truth tellers, always. It's not loving to lie or downplay or sugarcoat God's coming judgments. We are called to love sacrificially, but don't let the world define how we are to love. So let me ask you. Which relationship in your life needs sacrificial love to bear eternal fruit? Which relationship in your life needs sacrificial love to bear eternal fruit? As we start <clears throat> our third division, relationship between believers and the world, please turn to verse 18. I can see where the disciples would have a question about after Jesus is gone, what would be their relationship to the world? Several times in Jesus' ministry, the disciples discussed what would be or who would be the greatest in the kingdom. So now, with Jesus going, there wouldn't be a visible kingdom per se, but the disciples would be tasked with establishing the church. So the question comes up, how are unbelievers and the Jewish leaders going to treat the disciples as they establish the church. In this division, Jesus answers both of these questions. Before we read scripture, John this year has used the word world several times in his writing. 
But just so we have a good understanding, when John says the world, he isn't talking about the beautiful creation and everything in it that we call earth. But the term world refers to fallen humanity who reject Jesus and therefore reject the Father. But it's more than that. It also means the worldly system that Satan has developed and leads as the prince of this world. We know God has a plan, but Satan also has a plan. And part of his plan is to deceive the nations and people in an effort to steal worship and praise and turn people away from their creator. With that, let's start reading verse 18 to get a feel for the world's response to the disciples. If the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. The, world, the words of Jesus could not be clear. He didn't use a parable or an illustration, but told the disciples as directly as he could. The world hated me. So it will hate you, plain and simple. Ever since Genesis 3.15, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman are incompatible as darkness and light. The world system absolutely stands in opposition to Jesus and his followers. In the middle of the verse, there is a warning, a cautionary statement. And that is... Love of the world is something that we should not be striving for. In fact, if the world loves you, it probably means you are of the world and are not abiding in the true vine, Jesus. I'm sure many of you have observed this, but the world is okay with you saying God in, in a general sense or saying I'm spiritual, but they are not okay with the biblical Jesus, which Jesus confirms in verse 21. Let's read it. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. There are many recent cases of the world hating on the name of Jesus, and I'm sure many of you guys could come up with good examples. I recently read a Bible scholar's perspective on this, and he said, we no longer live in a Christian nation. We don't even live in a post-Christian nation. But we are now living in an anti-Christian nation. And he's probably right. Persecution of Christians is steadily increasing. And as we will study next year in Revelation, this intensifying wave a persecution will eventually give way to the tribulation. In this chapter, <clears throat> fruit has been mentioned a lot. But what is the fruit of hate? Well, it's persecution. Now, let's move deeper into the passage and read verses 22 and 24. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen and yet they have hated both me and my father. I'm sure this is obvious, but who is the they and the them who are guilty of sin that Jesus is talking about? It's the Jewish leadership who rejected Jesus as their Messiah, even after witnessing messianic miracles that were prophesied long ago. Now, when Jesus is gone, the disciples will be persecuted by the religious leaders, who will say the disciples are sinners, and they are doing a service to God by persecuting Jesus' followers. This type of pressure from religious, pious men can cause people to, to crack. But Jesus wanted his disciples to remain in him 
and stand strong in their faith, even in the face of persecution from the religious leaders. As we prepare to read our last verse today, let's back up the verse 23 and read it. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. This is a dreadful truth about people who reject Jesus. From God's perspective, they hate Jesus. And since Jesus is the visible image of the Father, they hate him as well. And since the Holy Spirit is molding us to look more like Jesus, they by default will also hate us. But they will disguise it or they will try to flip the tables on us and call us haters and define the Bible as hate speech. And when that happens, don't be surprised. I like what the Apostle Paul said on this subject in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm reading the NLT translation because the way it's worded really brings this verse to life. To those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom. But to those who are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. To the unbelieving world, we smell like death. Not our death, but theirs. But to, but to other believers, we smell like a sweet-smelling aroma. So don't be surprised if an unbeliever sniffs you out like a bloodhound in a crowd of people and is hostile to you for no apparent reason. Which brings us to our third principle, which is, Fruitful believers are hated by the world. Fruitful believers are hated by the world. That's a sad fact, but it's biblical. We should expect unbelievers will find our passion to follow Jesus as odd and will misunderstand our desire to live our lives according to God's word, the Bible. And unfortunately, this world is growing more hostile and violent towards Christians. But as Jesus pointed out, the world hated him, misunderstood him, mocked his testimony about the Father, and unjustly accused him and convicted him. We should not expect any better treatment. In fact, we need to be prepared for it so we can respond in a way that glorifies God. It's hard to allow our Christian ethics to come out when we are being abused, but maybe. That's the best time to strike back with your testimony and your witness as a Jesus follower. They might reject your testimony initially, or they might remember it and find it helpful later. I think Stephen in the book of Acts is a prime example of this. So let me ask you, how can you respond in a way that bears fruit when people hate and dislike you because you follow Jesus? How can you respond in a way that bears fruit when people hate and dislike you because you follow Jesus? As I wrap up today, the big idea for this chapter is remaining in Christ. When we are obedient to Jesus' commands, it allows us to be in a right relationship with him, those around us, and the world at large. Remaining in Christ through faithful obedience will allow God to grow a crop of eternal fruit through us. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that Jesus is the true vine, and through him we can have life and life abundantly. However, we know we are prone to wander like sheep and go down unproductive paths in this life. And so we ask you to prune us where we need to be pruned so that our lives will produce a crop of eternal fruit for your glory and so our joy may be made complete. In Christ's name, amen.